Mm. So I'm, 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 I'm quoting. And I, by the way, I don't deal with hyper Calvinists because I deal with just mainstream uh, Calvinists. So I wrote that book. Then I wrote, uh, does God love all or some to explain all of this and to lay it out. My heart is not to convince Calvinists. And I, and I mainly use what Calvinists say in primary documents and I interact with them so that people can see whether they want to be a Calvinist or not. And that's mm -hmm. what I tell people. You need to know that. And I decide I didn't want to. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry. And uh, my guest today is a returning guest, Ronnie Rogers, pastor in Oklahoma. He's a husband. He's a father, a grandfather. And uh, a well, a less well-known scholar. I think it's that. What's your what's your tag on your website? A lesser, not notes oh, from a not so notable pastor. I love that. Yeah, not so notable pastor. <laughs> well, welcome to the show again, Ronnie. Thanks for coming. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate you having me. Yeah, no, I'm, the pleasure is mine. I appreciate it. Uh, you can find Ronnie uh, um, on his website, RonnieRogers.com, and then there church's website trinitynorman.org as well he's been pastor there 24 years you said coming up on 24 years uh i'm i'm in my 24th year right now and by the way if you type in ronnierogers.com uh you'll get a head banging rock star <laughs> w in there ronnie w rogers oh is it okay yeah dot com i tell oh. people that's my night job the <laughs> I see that now. That's my apologies. Yeah, RonnieWRogers.com. It must have just saved there in my in my. Um... So you're not the head banging guy then. Okay, got uh, it. Well, I don't I don't <laughs> tell Christians that you know, but at night you can go there and you'll find me. So no, there I'm not that. <laughs> well, again, thank you for coming. Um, we've got the convention coming up pretty soon. Once again, it's going to be in Anaheim this year. Probably much smaller turnout than uh, than Nashville was. Although you never know. I mean. These days, you never know. Wow. Uh, why is it important? Because again, I've I've been in the convention very short compared to many uh, seasoned uh, pastors and theologians like you, authors, and so on. Um, why is it important to try and? Well, yeah, I guess we'll start with this. Why is it important to get to the convention in June? And, and what what's the difference whether you go or don't go? Well, uh, there's two things. One is. Uh, what we're fighting for and the second is the process in which we use as southern baptists so i'll probably answer those in reverse order mm -hmm. most uh things that we call denominations uh we're a convention not a denomination that's a technical difference does have a significance but uh consider us for the moment like other denominations we are different in this they are top down mm -hmm. meaning the there are people who are over the churches, who make decisions for the churches. They have influence who pastors where, what that church does, et cetera, et cetera. And then they decide primarily what happens in their denomination. The person in the pew has little or no influence. Mm -hmm. With the Baptist and the Southern Baptist Convention, we are a bottom-up convention. There's the, the president, the executive committee, uh, no one is over any local church. It is autonomous. And when you participate in the Southern Baptist Convention by supporting the cooperative program and you are a you uh, adopt the Baptist faith and message, then you get to send messengers to the convention. So many times, even for a smaller church, that can be 10 to 12 messengers. So those messengers so let's just say somebody joined our church a month ago. They can go to the convention if this church chooses them as a messenger from this church, and they can go and vote on all the issues that come up during the convention, one of which will be the presidency. And so it's a very bottom up. So it's important that people go because the leaders and so forth will already have a ton of people there and the people that for example nam last year supported people going to the convention to vote so they're going to vote with them and uh, but when you send them there and the 
issues come up, they can vote, and that really sets the, the trajectory in many ways, but most importantly is the election of the president because the way our system works, to put it in its simplest form, is people from the local church go to the convention, they vote on a president, and that president, once elected, appoints a committee on committees. That's two people from every state convention are on that committee. So he appointed that. From then on, it's done by election. Then that committee goes and gets two people from each state, and they will be recommended at next year's convention to serve on the committee on nominations. And that committee then recommends everybody who serves on all of our boards, of our mm -hmm. six seminaries, of our North American Mission Board, uh, the International Mission Board, et cetera. Every board we have, the ERLC, et cetera. So it all starts with the people in the pew electing a president. Okay. And that president starts to trickle down. And if you lose the presidency, you can't get a hold of anything and you can't change anything. So it's mm. critical. And that's what we did in the conservative resurgence. Uh, people went to the convention. And finally, they were fed up with what was going on. And the first president they elected in 1979 was Adrian Rogers. And from then on, for the next 25 years, we were able to elect conservative presidents. Mm -hmm. And it turned our convention from being uh, liberal with neo-orthodoxy and going deeper and deeper into that, both morally and theologically, to where every president of every entity and all the trustees were inerrantist, wow. which totally turned the convention around. So now we're back in that again, where we have to do it. And one of the most important things for people to realize is the pastors and teachers and leaders, they cannot do it. It takes lay people. And anybody that was lived through the resurgence would tell you in a heartbeat that if it were not for lay people getting involved, they took vacations, they paid their own ways, they did all kind of sacrifices, the resurgence would have never happened. And that's the same way it will be this time. Wow. Okay. So what are, because I mean, that's good. I appreciate that. But, you know, let's let's be a little pushback here. I hear and less so, I think, these days, but I still was hearing this last year, even at this time. We're all conservatives, Ronnie. What's the big deal? I mean, we all believe the Bible. We all believe, you know, the Bible's inspired and, and whatnot. I mean, we're, we're all we all love Jesus. I, there's there's no reason for the conservative Baptist network to exist. There's no reason for talking about these certain things. There, there really isn't much issue going on. What are the actual issues then? Yeah. Well, uh, just to give a little historical analogy there, that was the same thing said by those in the citadels of leadership in the convention mm -hmm. when the resurgence was starting. <laughs> no problem. We're all conservatives mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. But the deeper you dug, the worse it got. Wow. So that's been said and it continues to be said. However, so I can take myself personally, it's been said to me and it's been said that I was slandering, uh, uh, saying that there were these problems. Mm. So then I offer the documentation, quotes in context, articles that I have written that document primary sources. And to date, none of those that have said there's no problem this is being exaggerated by the CBN. None of them have looked at the research. Mm. So they make the accusations. And I'm not the only one that can put forth documentation. But I'm just telling you, I know this firsthand on both. Uh, there's been uh, uh, with the woke or, or critical race theory and so forth, that penetrating our seminaries, liberation theology, and I, I think it's two seminaries. I don't think it's all of them, but I do mm -hmm. think it's two. And others document one of them. I document uh, what's going on at Southern, at least some of it. And again, these are primary sources and so forth. But other things that are happening is uh, like homosexuality. So you, what you'll find, what makes it kind of difficult is, and you can even do this with CRT, 
Mm -hmm. So Dr. Moeller will denounce critical race theory and the most uncertain uh, in the most certain terms. He does an excellent job in doing that. Mm -hmm. However, he hires faculty who claim to believe in critical race theory. They use critical race theory, intersectionality, and Dr. Moeller and I show where he actually uses the language of CRT, not biblical language, when talking about certain things. So you have the denunciation and then you have this. Mm -hmm. wow. And same thing goes on with homosexuality. They will deny uh, or they'll say homosexuality is a sin. Then they do what I call, they become too accommodating. Mm. Meaning uh, Greer, J.D. Greer, he accepted their desired pronouns. Mm -hmm. He uh, was using someone else, but basically said the Bible shouts at things like greed, but it whispers about that. And, and I've written an article to show that's not true. Mm -hmm. Beth Moore, she had a section in a book she had written that dealt with homosexuality biblically and that it was a sin. Well, she later recanted and said she was too harsh and she took that out of her book. So I wrote an article on it and show the quote in the book and show what she said and she did. But she still says homosexuality is sin. Uh, Russell Moore did this with the reparative therapy. And he denounced reparative therapy in the most uh, derogatory fashion mm -hmm. and said it doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. But, but characteristic of uh, Dr. Moore, and I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm just saying this is the way he has done things. He creates a straw man saying it doesn't work. But, and so I interact with his article and his denunciation of this and what he said, he never quotes the founder of reparative therapy, the man who developed it. He never even quotes the secular psychologists and psychiatrists who have used it successfully with some. He doesn't quote like First Stone here in Oklahoma, who has an incredible success rate of about 70%. Mm. So, but he, but you see, he creates these straw men. Uh, Dr. Moeller, he used to deny uh, the idea of orientation, sexual, you know, orientation, which homosexuals mm -hmm. rely on. And so, a few years ago, he he rejected that and he apologized for it, and now he accepts it. Mm. Well, when you when you read what he said, so I take an article on him on that, what he said, what he rejected, and then he wrote a 2,600 word article trying to explain when he got a lot of pushback <laughs> that he didn't really mean what they think he meant. Hmm. And wow. so I go through and analyze his response. And my point in bringing these up is, but Dr. Moeller, and I, and I say this in my series of articles I did on them, I'm not challenging their dis, their belief that homosexuality is a sin. That's not my challenge. My challenge is when you are becoming too accommodating by giving in on these major areas, and when you put the cumulative of Russell Moore, Beth Moore, Dr. Moeller, and Dr. Greer together, many of the, the strongholds they've had are now vanished by our mm. leader. And by the way, they celebrated when Dr. Moeller changed his mind on orientation. So I go into that in detail. I quote oh. them what they're saying. And that's the problem. The same thing with CRT, as I mentioned, denounce it. And yet we're hiring people who do it. Uh, Dr. Moeller had an opportunity when Resolution 9 was being debated. He was asked by Tom Askell, and Tom said this himself, uh, that was he going to speak up against it? And Dr. Moeller said, I don't know, but he never did speak up. That was the time to speak when it was on the floor. And at yeah. that time, Dr. Moeller had the stature. I think it would have failed. Mm. But he didn't. The next day, he wrote an article denouncing it. You see, so this is this is part of the problem of getting people to understand that they're 
one day they're denouncing something uh, and the next day they're hiring somebody that does that or they're not speaking at the time that it matters. You know, yeah. I tell my wife something, it doesn't matter near as much as if I had a moment at the convention to say the same thing that might have turned the tide. Mm. That's what's going on that makes it, you have these moral issues, particularly acquiescing with homosexuality and transgenderism and things of this nature. And then you have the critical race theory and all that's involved in that. And it really comes from the Marxian idea developed by Max Horkheimer, known as critical theory. Mm -hmm. And this is what ties everything together and makes it understandable for those that are not familiar with it. And uh, see, Danny Aiken, and I've known Danny Aiken. We both are Chriswell grads. Uh, you know, we were all in the resurgence together. I mean, with Al Mohler, I was in a room that uh, was asked, uh, can we support Al Mohler? And my vote was yes. So, I mean, I've known these people a long time. And what I'm what we're saying is they're not the same. And Danny Aiken uh, on this liberation theology, he will denounce it mm. as he should. But he has Walter Strickland on faculty, whom I have watched him talk about how some of these books have really blessed his life. Mm -hmm. Danny Aiken, again, had a this standpoint of epistemology, which kind of means you need to have all these different groups to interpret the scripture together, racial groups. And so he had a scholar from Africa, a black woman, and she was talking and a couple of people on Twitter uh, attacked her for what she was doing, not attacked her, but her approach. Yeah. And Danny Eakin came back and said, you know, it's wrong to do that. She's a scholar. And if you're going to do that, listen to her whole uh, lecture. Well, I did. And I responded to that lecture and it, it still maintained, um, you know, the, the grammatical, historical grammatical method. But the interesting thing was when she told the four things it maintained, the first one was application. The last thing was uh, the historical grammatical method. Well, actually, that's the first thing. Right. So he, he does this and there's other things they're doing. They're layering. They believe in the historical gr grammatical method. I mean, I know students who have been at Southeastern and I think uh, uh, John Harris documents some of this, mm -hmm. and, but they, they have uh, told me, they said they're layering, doing what's called layering, meaning your personal experience. They believe in the historical grammatical method, but you layer your experience over that. And that can even trump the historical. Well, that's what I thought she did. And uh, so anyway, they can denounce it on one hand. And on the other hand, they're sliding it in there. It's very hard to detect and it's very hard to prove. Yeah. No, that's that's incredibly helpful. I mean, it's and it's good to hear that again. And clearly, you're not name calling. You're not being slanderous. I would say at all. You're saying, hey, this is what's going on. And I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I mean, I do the the, the channel I have here on YouTube and other places as well. Is that listen, Jesus is Lord, and God's word is God's word. And are we going to stick to this, or are we going to constantly let the things of the world seep in. And that's what always happens. I mean, it was the same yeah. thing happening 500 years ago, you know, but the battle 500 years ago, isn't the same battle today. And I know that full well, uh, by, you know, going to seminary, going to Southern. Right. And, you know, I loved my experience there a lot and I didn't really see too much, but I'm not omniscient. I didn't yeah. see everything. Um, but I had that, you know, you see uh, people go back to Luther, they go back to this. They, and I love church history. I love, theologians of the past there's so many and there's you know there's more diversity than people think but to stand in front of the pope now pope francis we anybody we could say right. you're not head of the church you right. you're you're false you're you're on your way to hell you should repent and turn to christ and he would probably chuckle and say something in latin and move on like <laughs> but if we did that 500 years ago we would be burnt at the stake yeah. right and so Clearly now, 500 years ago, no one had a question, or even 50 years ago for that matter, had a question what a boy was, a girl was, what marriage was, anything like that. And now you say two plus two is four, you know, and that's, you know, white, white supremacy and misogyny, et cetera. And you say boys and girls can't change genders. Duh. You know, everybody freaks out. And so that's the bombardment on the church. And I think a lot of our leaders have completely 
you know, just left so many doors open and just not stuck to the scripture. Just, you don't have to be jerk. You don't have to be rude. Um, but be firm. And so many people are just not at all. It's, it's very sad. Yeah. And on the, on the, uh, you know, they don't want to be overly harsh. I can surely appreciate that sentiment. Sure. But it becomes harsh when you, uh, treat the scripture in a subjective way. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, they, they also, like on the critical race theory issues, there is a strong desire. This actually started back in the 60s. and Shelby still wrote a book on white guilt. But it's basically the worst thing to be called now today is a racist. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be a racist. And sometimes they adopt things that they shouldn't. In other words, I'm not a racist. Our, our church has about 10 different races or ethnicities in it at all times Mm -hmm. and i have biracial nieces or great nieces and nephews my staff has mixed family i mean we have it you know everywhere but uh but they will adopt critical race theory thinking and and rightly so if you don't adopt it then you're going to be called a racist Mm -hmm. but it you cannot adopt it without compromising scripture i don't care if it's even analytical tools right well, and then my yeah, my argument was why we don't need any analytical tools. <laughs> like, right. Why why aren't we doing that with materialistic evolution? Why aren't we saying, well, the biologists and the anthropologists and the astronomers they have some good things to say, you know, and therefore Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I mean, right. like that's the logical end. And some people, say, oh, it's a slippery slope. It's dumb. That I don't want to hear that argument. That's dumb yeah. because most of those times when people said that in the past, the very same thing that was being warned happened. I mean, it's the whole boy who cries wolf. You know, yeah. and and anyway, so well, that's right. And see, we we if we're going to talk about analytical tools, so I'm not trying to uh, be overly reductionistic, but if we're going to talk about analytical tools, our analytical tool is scripture, mm-hmm. meaning that's the lens with which we view everything and adjudicate what is right and wrong from. So yeah. when they bring in these other analytical tools that our world views, then they are subjugating and will do it more and more subjugate the scripture. I just uh, put an article out today that the SBC is waltzing into the ballroom of Marxism Mm. by our adopting these things as analytical tools, because I go through the, the founders of critical race theory, I go through the Max Horkheimer who developed the term, coined the term and developed the term critical theory and which they use and uh, Adorno also contributed to that. And then I go through just several Marxists in education, uh, Gustav who is a liberation theologian, on and on and on. And they all refer to these things, including Marxism as analytical tools. Mm. So. What they did in that, oh. they that what they tried to do was we're only going to use them as analytical tools as though that neutralizes them and maybe even Christianizes them. Right. But just because you call something an analytical tool does not mean that it's not bringing along all this other baggage. And there's mm-hmm. actually a guy who's very influential in bringing Marxism into uh, education, and his name is Michael Apple, I believe, or maybe Apple B, he's in the article. But anyway, he, he gives a quote in his doctoral dissertation, basically saying, you know, some people don't want to use the uh, analytical tools from Marxism because they think it's going to, you know, taint it and they're going to have to bring all the other. But he said, that's not true. Well, that was shortly before he openly became a Marxist. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's difficult to really see uh, in the moment for some people, I think. And then, yeah. but it seems like, and I'm not very old, but I love history. It seems like the last 15 years, like God hit fast forward or something like, and there's so many things that are just like these rising and falling mm-hmm. of things that seemingly used to take a generation, five yeah. generations, 10 generations with, I mean, sexual liberation, you know, um, Obergefell, right? 2015. Right. Uh, I mean, even in California was, was prop eight. We had, there's propositions there in California we had 
and that was legalizing same-sex marriage and it still won it was still natural marriage was still uh, held up by a 52 uh, percent margin up or 52 percent not very much but that was 2008 and seven years later obergefell well seven years now and it's we're after your children we're going to convert them right. it's not just oh we just we just want to be just like you we just we right. just want to have family we just want to do this we want to be able to adopt kids we're, we're going to leave yeah. you alone you have disney saying you know they're going to indoctrinate it's all about trans stuff now i mean and it's it's ultimately egalitarian in the sense that everybody's the same there's no difference not just women preachers some people hear that and think that's all that is yeah. but anybody can be anything which then subverts parents to children and then well the the adults you know you're not available to raise your children therefore we're going to take them as the government i mean it's just it's never ending until people stand up and and tell them no that's uh, to right. sit down so yeah. That's exactly right. It's crazy. Um, you have so you pastor. You've been pastoring a long, long time. Uh, you write. You're a theologian. You you've got a blog uh, that you're very active on. Uh, you used to subscribe to one soteriolo soteriology, and you've changed. Now this is sometimes people get bent out of shape and they think uh, one side is anti or against or they hate them or people can't switch or whatever. Uh, but I respect your uh, approach, and we're talking quite a bit about it. And I know there's quite a few other people out there. The Southern Baptist Convention is a larger tent with yeah. Calvinists, non-Calvinists, Arminians, uh, provisionists, sometimes called traditionalists. Uh, you're an extensivist, uh, yeah. and you subscribe to extensivism. And you used to be a Calvinist for a long time. Can you flesh that out a little bit and just kind of help the audience just see a different side of that debate? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I, I don't uh, hate or attack any Calvinist. I consider them my brothers and sisters in Christ. Hmm. We have a serious disagreement on this, but there are many things we agree on. But So I don't attack the person, nor do I get involved in that. As a matter of fact, through the years since I've changed, I've been attacked by some who are extensivists, and I'm using that term in a broad way for non-Calvinists, who have attacked me for being hmm. too friendly with Calvinists. So... So anyway, I, I don't view them that way. But I, uh, when I became a Christian, came in Southern Baptist life, and I'll try to make it as brief as I can, but I, I began studying and reading, and it ended up that I was reading uh, Calvinists and Calvinist uh, systematic theologies and uh, theology books and commentaries, and, and I became a Calvinist, and I was a four-point Calvinist. Now, I don't think that position serves what we argue that it did now. I, I think the five point have a, a greater logic on their side in this, not just from the uh, coherency of the tulip, mm -hmm. but from the scripture itself. I think what we thought not believing in limited atonement accomplished, and I thought it did and taught it, it did not accomplish. So anyway, um, but so, so I was a Calvinist for 33 years, 20 of that, I was unabashed. I had no reservations. Mm -hmm. But uh, I study this way even to this day. I, I have so many things going on. I'm working about 25 different projects right now. And so I run into things that make me question or think. And I just put myself a node in a folder. Mm -hmm. And used to, that was a physical folder. Now it's on the computer. But and, and so my hope is one day I'll have time to go look at that and evaluate it in a deeper way and answer some questions that I wasn't able to answer at the moment. And so with Calvinism, that happened over many, many years. And finally, I, I started going back in and trying to dig deeper and to try to answer these, which I was absolutely convinced I would answer. Them. Mm. It wasn't that I thought I wasn't going to be able to. I thought I would. I just, I'd read, I mean, I've read all the top Calvinists and even outside the convention with Richard Muller and different ones. And so when I started down that road, which took me about 12 or 13 years, and this is not putting it in any order of significance, but I'm just, I do this in, in the last book I wrote on uh, Calvinism and extensivism, but I, I just began to do uh, some real basic analysis so, for example, the entailments. Uh, Calvinism talks about what it believes a lot, but a lot of times the entailments are swathed under 
the term mystery, mm. which in any other realm, I began to look at it and I would say, okay, if I was talking about this in any other realm, would it be a mystery or a contradiction? Mm. And what I found was that the mysteries that I had used for so many years were Calvinistically generated mysteries. In other words, if you, if you weren't a Calvinist, you wouldn't have a mystery. So it's like, how is God the cause of everything and yet not the cause of sin? Well, there are a lot of ways we answer that. We use compatible uh, moral freedom which I think is misdefined many times in Calvinism. And I go into this in great detail in a lot of places because I think it and libertarian understanding those helps you an enormous amount. And normally mm -hmm. both are, are uh, misrepresented. But in, 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 in compatibilism, which is called soft determinism. So there's determinism that everything is determined. And because everything is determined, man is not morally responsible. And compatibilism, it is that moral freedom is compatible with determinism, hence okay. the name. And it's called soft. But what most people misunderstand is the soft does not make it less deterministic than hard or raw determinism. It is equally deterministic. But what it says differently is that if a person chooses to do something according to his greatest desire, then he is morally responsible. So that's what they mean by freedom, that you're okay. choosing according to your greatest desire. But the entailment of compatibilism is, while that's true, the desire is determined. In other words, it is determinative antecedents that determine every desire from which you freely choose. And another way to look at it is, in the moral moment of decision, according to compatibilism, and Richard Muller tries to get away from this, but I don't think he's successful at all, and I write about that, but uh, and, and well, I could, Paul Helm uses the word uh, permission or permit 51 times in a, in a chapter he wrote on mm -hmm. how God's not responsible for sin, so he uses the form of the word permission, but the problem is in compatibilism and decreto theology, permission or, or his permissive will is no less determined than the uh, his decretive will. Because according to compatibilism, in the moral moment of decision, the person could not have chosen differently than he did in fact choose. He may have chosen to do that freely because he chose according to greatest desire, but he could not have chosen differently in that moral moment of decision. And the greater des greatest desire was determined. So when you trace all this back, you keep going back to determinative antecedents, determinative antecedents. And in Calvinism, we would say, well, uh, God is not the cause because he uses secondary and causes and so forth. And now mm -hmm. I recognize it doesn't matter if he uses secondary or tertiary or quaternary or quinary or secondary, or it doesn't matter how many causes, he is the ultimate cause. Okay. He is the one who created man with compatible moral freedom, and he gave the antecedent cause that starts everything going, giving the greatest desire. So I sat with a Calvinist, a good friend of mine, still a good friend, and we uh, met for a few weeks, an hour, two hours a week, and I kept going back to Adam about could he have chosen differently in the moral moment of decision? And of course, Calvinists say, well, intellectually, he could, but not morally. So we had, again, as Calvinists, we have all kinds of answers for these things. But my question, I'm, I try to make it real simple, and I try to get away from these technical issues. I say, so let me ask you this. I'm not asking you, could he intellectually or morally? I'm asking, could the man, Adam, in his totality, at the moral moment of decision that he chose to eat, could he have chosen differently? And he paused for a little bit. Now, this is after about three weeks of going mm -hmm. through all the different arguments. And he said no. And the well, only thing I said to him was, I said, this is what I'm asking. When you preach that passage, tell them that. Don't mm. let them think you believe what I believe. And that's what really got me was we were saying things that left people believing that we believe a certain thing, but we really don't. Interesting. Okay. 
And so anyway, there's a there's the entailments. There's a double talk. Of, you know, John Piper wrote a book, you know, uh, about uh, uh, God's love for the whole world or salvation for the world. I have it up here on my shelf. I can't recall the name of it right now. But it, but anyway, it should be some in the world if mm. you're going to be accurate with Calvinism. So I don't I don't have to, I don't want to misrepresent Calvinism. And I want to tell it like it is. And then if somebody wants to be a Calvinist, that's fine. It's a historic belief. But you can't be that and not face these entailments, not use the double uh, double language that's used. A lot of times you'll find Calvinists, and again, I quote some of this in my book, of Calvinists that I genuinely love and respect. And they'll interpret a passage just like I do as a non-Calvinist. Hmm. And then they'll bring in unconditional election or whatever, which is not even in the passage. But the point is that they denounce in no uncertain terms libertarian freedom. Yeah. And so they're arguing the one moment they'll be speaking libertarianly as though there was a real choice and each choice had consequences. And these choices were accessible to the individual at that time. That is not compatibilism. That's libertarian. And then yeah. you can even get deeper into this, that many of the most knowledgeable Calvinists do not believe that God could be sovereign over libertarian free beings because hmm. he could not know what they would choose. And these are called contingencies until the person chose it. Well, I answer that uh, and I've tried to answer all these problems from an extensivist viewpoint. I didn't just ignore them. I give an answer I'm yeah. not trying to convince Calvinists, but in my own mind and heart, I needed to do that. So the yeah. short end of this, I went through looking at verses, the key verses of Calvinism, like John 6, 44. And so I, so these are simple things. And I understand they're simple. They're not high theology or anything like that. But you have to look at the definitions they use, because if the definitions of Calvinism are correct, then all you have is Calvinism. Mm -hmm. So I have to see if their definitions, was there a one is good or better even same thing with interpretation so john you're looking in john chapter six and you know all the father gives shall come to me and so it's reduced to uh god gives and they come that that's the end of that mm -hmm. but so everybody knows there are other verses but what i did is i asked myself the question okay that transaction and i'm not trying to reduce it to merely a transaction but just to make it simple God gives, they come. And that's their elective uh, passage. I don't think the context teaches that at all because the requirement for believing is mentioned many times. But what I did was, in a very simple fashion, I said, okay, is there anything missing from that verse, just that verse, that we would all agree is essential for that transaction to take place? So it couldn't be what non-Calvinists believe or Calvinists. It had to be that everybody would agree this is essential. And the point of that is, if there is one essential missing, then that opens the door there are other essentials. So that's the logic of that. Well, there is an essential that Christ had to die on the cross for sins. That's not mentioned there. That transaction could not happen without that. And that opens the door. So I would do this with verse after verse after verse. I did it with definitions. I mean, if you look at the word elect and you just strip it of everything and you can look it up in a Greek dictionary, you can look it up then how we use it in English. It means to choose. That's what it means. That's what it means. Choose. So then you have to ask the question, what is comprehended in the mind of the chooser? What is, mm. what is comprehended in the word? So let me give you an example. When we use, we chose a president, and they say that in Russia, we mean very different things because what we comprehend in the term choose or elect is very different. Theirs is mm. top down, ours is bottom up. Yeah. And so you can go through this over and over, choosing a ball team. You could be choosing 10 guys, and I'm going to choose 10. We're going to have you know little kids playing ball. And I choose this guy from Great Britain. And you're puzzled because he doesn't know anything about baseball. He's never even seen the game. And you're thinking, you, but you don't know. You just know I elected him and you elected these others. And later, 
you say, hey, Ronnie, why did you choose the Brit? And I said, because I like Brits. Yeah. Now I gave you the reason. So I think you take these terms and the rest of the New Testament tells us what is embedded or em embodied in these different terms. In other words, it's not just as simple as, you know, putting unconditional in front of it and so forth. So yeah. anyway, uh, it was just a long, about 13 year process. I wrote Reflections of a Disenchanted Calvinist, came out of that in 2012. And that book actually started to be, when I was writing it, it was the reflections of a, a minor Calvinist. Hmm. But by the time I got to the end of it, I determined I was not a Calvinist and I doffed the label. And that brings up another area I won't go into unless you want to. But there's a huge psychological component to this. Mm. Leaving Calvinism. You got to remember, that's all I knew. Yeah. That's all I studied. And what was I if I wasn't that? Yeah. And, I, and I'm dealing with guys who have left Calvinism or are leaving Calvinism. And one will not leave Calvinism because of that psychological factor interesting yeah yeah i mean why don't you just you know briefly touch on that and then we'll we'll look at the uh the two presidents or the president okay. nominees i guess okay. uh nominations yeah just talk a little bit about that psychological because again me uh in my upbringing um spiritually and then going to seminary and me just working through a lot of these things myself and talking with people and seeing you know a lot of people know the cage stage calvinist and you know, just arguing. And then there's other people that don't really ever want to take a stand or there's people that are anti-Calvinist. Uh, why don't you just go through that a little bit, just kind of the psychological aspect of it uh, okay. and just flesh that. And then just kind of, I guess, touch on a little bit more what extensivism is just because okay. that's very, that's a new term to me. It's probably a new term to a lot of people. So touch on that too, if you would. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do the extensivism and then the psychological so extensivism, when I left, well, I don't know, maybe I have to do a little mixture here. But <laughs> when funny. I left Calvinism, so I was always a Calvinist. I was a Calvinist. And I, and by the way, I didn't hate non-Calvinist. I didn't look at them badly. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, this is not what I do. I look at the, what's being said, you know, but when I left, so the question is, what am I? And I'm going to be writing on this and I don't want to write and say I'm a non-Calvinist. There are several problems with being a negative. Right. And so I didn't want a man's name. I didn't want it to be pejorative because that's not the way I approach this because these are my brothers and sisters. So I, I, try, I coined the term extensivism to be a direct parallel with Calvinism. Okay. Calvinism is exclusive. It is only about the elect truly in eternity. Extensivism is that love that God has for the elect is really for everyone. The provision is for everyone, et cetera, et cetera. So I chose a parallel that I'm arguing against the, the exclusiveness of Calvinism. And I'm saying, no, it is extensive that he died for everyone in the same way. So they'll say he died for everyone, but it's not in the same way. And, you know, they talk about the call. Well, there's the external call. It can be resisted, but the internal call cannot. And that only goes to the elect. So I'm saying the call goes to everybody. So it extends to everybody rather than being exclusive to some. And I deal with that in my uh, the last book I wrote, which the first book I wrote was kind of me thinking through what my problems were with Calvinism. And that was my reflections on that and mm -hmm. issues that I had. By the time I'd left, the book, Does God Love All or Some, is my laying out what extensivism is. Okay. And I lay it out. I define it. I have a general definition. And then the more precise definition is what, how I explain these things. And then I just go through all the issues uh, of, ex of showing what I believe in in contrast to Calvinism, what I think are the problems. And I tried to answer, you know, how does God know uh, uh, contingencies that don't exist prior? That's that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how can God be all powerful if he's uh, in sovereign, if he's if he's not controlling every single move? Like even Millard Erickson, who is a moderate Calvinist, says, when I move my right finger, 
God predetermined that to happen. Hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting, and I, by the way, I don't deal with hyper-Calvinists because I deal with just mainstream uh, Calvinists. So I wrote that book, then I wrote uh, Does God Love All or Some to explain all of this and to lay it out. My heart is not to convince Calvinists. And I, and I mainly use what Calvinists say in primary documents, and I interact with them so that people can see whether they want to be a Calvinist or not. And that's mm-hmm. what I tell people. You need to know that. And I decide I didn't want to. Yeah. Well, the psychological thing is when I, the moment that I was alone in my study and I was looking at that title and I had come to believe I wasn't, because I really only think there's five point, four point, and that I don't think three, two, and one are, are Calvinist. Mm-hmm. And I don't think total depravity is the issue. I know Calvinists, we say that. I think it's unconditional election. Once you accept unconditional election, then the question is not whether you are Calvinist, but it's whether you're consistent or not. Mm, interesting. Okay. So, so when I wrote Reflections, I, here I was, all I'd ever known, I was a Calvinist. I wasn't a Calvinist. All the people I study and people I loved then and still love. And I'll just use John MacArthur because we all know him. Yeah. Or know who he is. And I love John MacArthur and still do to this day. Matter of fact, when I had to write in my first book and second book, maybe dealing with uh, where he interpreted the passage contradictory to Calvinism, mm. talking about people could have chosen. It was sad that they chose that way. Well, no, it's not because God determined it to be that way. So it's not sad. Mm. It's glorious. And so I but the first time I did that. I can't remember now. It's been a number of years, but it was either a day or two days that I didn't write a word. It was so hard for me because I respected him. I love him and I still do. And so it was very difficult. That's the psychological part Hmm. is, am I going to do this? Because I'm not trying to attack people. But anyway, I finally did it. and I've done it uh, since. So you have the psychological component. The people you have esteemed the most, you now are going to be writing against them. You have the psychological component of what you're going to call yourself. And then the other one, these all dovetail, but the other one is, and this particular guy that I, is unwilling to leave Calvinism, he said, so what do I do about all these Calvinists that I like and everything? And I said, you can still like them. You can still mm-hmm. love them. You can still study them and learn from them. You just disagree on this area. And he does. Yeah. And I said, I don't have to hate them. And I said, I disagree with other people and they disagree with me, but we don't have to hate each other. That's personalizing too much. And he said, I don't know that I can do that. Mm. So you're, wow. you're, you're, in other words, I didn't become an Arminian. Extensivism is not Arminianism. And, and that's why yeah. people like Leighton Flower chose provisionism because he doesn't, he, I, I can't defend Arminianism. I, I studied Calvinism all my uh, Christian life. I don't have time to go study Arminianism and learn all the nuances and yeah. then start writing on it. So I coined a term and I explained it in my own words and my own understanding. So the psychological thing is you're going to have to speak against some people you've admired and learned from, have helped you immensely. And that, what are you going to call yourself? And then what are you going to do about these people? If they're really wrong, are you going to still support it? So the last thing I would say on that is, so I wrote uh, on a book on church discipline and I wrote reflections and a guy in Mark Dever's church, I know you know him, very strong Calvinist. Mm -hmm. And Mark and I have uh, known each other generally for many years now. We've been in meetings together and so forth, but not personally. So anyway, this guy read my book, Reflections of a Disenchanted Calvinist. He was a teacher in Mark's church at Capitol Hill. Well, he just came unglued and started ranting against Calvinism Mm. and what they were doing and how they weren't, you know, following God. And just, I mean, he just became so strong in it. So Mark's pastors contacted me. And I told him, I said, I don't agree with that. Yeah. If he doesn't agree with you anymore, he ought to graciously go to another church. But I said, now he has a, an ecclesiological problem. Mm. He's going against the leadership. 
So he's condemning you for one thing and he's doing the other. And they asked me if I would write him. And I did. I wrote him a lengthy letter and, you know, in every way I could try to encourage him to leave the church graciously because they're accountable to God. And I said, you're doing the very thing you're accusing them of. Well, then hmm. he attacked me. Oh, dear. Wow. For being too nice to Calvin. So anyway, I wrote back Goodness. to one of the pastors there and I said, uh, it's my my experience of church discipline, which I practiced for 30 years. I said, my experience, I would say that you're going to have to church discipline him. I hope that doesn't happen, but you will probably have to. And sure enough, they did. Wow. And my point in saying that, I mean, I worked with Mark's pastors to try to resolve that, even yeah. though the guy agreed soteriologically with me, he was ecclesiologically wrong. Yeah. Well, no, that's helpful. I appreciate appreciate you fleshing that out. I hope that's helpful for a lot of people because I think sometimes we can get stuck in stuck in our echo chambers or we feel like, oh, no, I like that guy or that guy is that and he's not this or whatever. And then all of a sudden you 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 don't want to support him or her uh, or something. And, and, you know, people can do that. But I feel like the further we go and the further our culture continually, especially in the West, gets hostile, uh, we should be building bridges <laughs> to use yeah. the to use yeah. the common parlance but at least say do you love christ is yeah. the bible god's word do you want to see people washed and changed and saved and walking in holiness do you want to see that yes oh absolutely well yes you know and depending on people's answers to questions like that i think we should lock arms yeah. uh, far more than you know i mean i would disagree with probably everything a Roman Catholic might say, but I'm also not, I'm not, I'm unwilling to say out loud uh, or even in my heart that all Roman Catholics are going to hell. I just, I don't, I don't, because again, now you're talking about this weird, you're sounding cultish. You're sounding this and the Bible is what God's word is. And there was no Roman Catholic church. There was no Protestant church. There was no anything at, at the penning of, of the new Testament in particular. And so to say that I might, you know, upset some people, but it's just we have to turn it on around and sh hold up the mirror and say how turn all the terms back on you turn it back on you look at this thing look at your system and can it stand up to the scrutiny that you're putting on others um anyway so it's it's it, ultimately christ is the lord he is the salvation he is the one who provides propitiation for sin he is the one who's the substitute and all that we just celebrated right easter recently resurrection day so yeah. anyway i appreciate your your sharing that uh and that's a good story although a, a troubling and difficult story but a, a story nonetheless that's good that's helpful for that guy at capitol hill uh but speaking of bridges and we'll we'll wrap up with this here or, or get there get there uh tom askell and vody bacham they're both strong calvinists great preachers uh authors founders ministry is is what tom leads uh dr askell and they're Calvinists, and yet you support them. Why? Why do you do that? Then I, you know, you probably already answered that, but flesh that out a little bit more than just, you know, maybe that guy at Capitol Hill would look at you and say, "How could you support them? Are you insane?" Yeah. They're Calvinists. They're part of the devil, and there's plenty of non-Calvinist, crazy people out there, and there's plenty of Calvinists who, you know, think if you're not a five pointer, you're going to hell. You know, let oh, alone being a four pointer or anything else. And so, why would you support again playing the little that? opposite advocate there, Tom Askell and Vody Bauckham for their uh, nominations. Well, I do support both of them. And I actually, uh, nothing against Vody, but I was dealing with the presidency more of the convention. And I wrote an endorsement for Tom. Mm -hmm. And I knew when I did that, the five or six people who know me are going to, there's going to be some pushback on why I as a non-Calvinist, would support uh, Tom, who is a strong Calvinist. I mean, mm. he's president of the founders. Right. And so I knew that was going to happen. So when I wrote the endorsement, sure enough, I mean, no, it was actually before I got my endorsement out, the CBN people, some of them were talking about it. And this guy said, are you going to support Tom Askell, who's this strong Calvinist? And they know I'm not. And so I wrote a little thing on Facebook answering that briefly. Why? And this guy said, 
I agree. Thank you for that. So I, when I wrote the endorsement, I told a couple of people, I said, I'm simultaneously working on a blog of why I, a non-Calvinist, support Tom Askell for president of the SBC. Mm-hmm. And I wrote it. And because I knew I was going to get pushback, but also I wanted to, I wanted to lay this case out because a lot of younger guys may not understand the, the full dynamic of what we're in. But those mm-hmm. of us who live through the resurgence do. So I wrote this blog and basically I, I lay out the problems in the convention or some of them, some of the things I've already mentioned, but there are other problems with the ERLC and on and on. Mm-hmm. And Tom and I would agree on all of those. And then I went into seven reasons why I support him as a non-Calvinist. And the, the first one I give is in the resurgence, Calvinist and non-Calvinist. So I would have been a Calvinist then, but we worked together side by side. Uh, Dr. Paige Patterson, who is as far from Calvinism as you can get, mm-hmm. and he and Tom Askell have been friends for years. Yeah, and Tom was a, a strong uh, voice in the resurgence. Dr. Patterson, of course, was. And so we were fighting uh, side by side. I was in meetings across the country with different people, and we, it never came up. We, we never discussed Calvinism. It wasn't that we were avoiding it. We were fighting a monster that was going to destroy both of us, basically, in the convention. Mm, yeah. And that was liberalism and specifically neo-orthodoxy and then the changing of morals and so forth. So we, And we could not do it alone. The, the non-Calvinists couldn't do it and the Calvinists couldn't do it. It took the Calvinists, non-Calvinists, and all the lay people. Yeah. So we fought side by side because there was a greater enemy and we both recognize, and I'm not, I can't include people who hate me or don't think I don't think theologically or the people on my side that think that Calvinists are heretics. So I'm not trying to include everybody, but mm-hmm. those of us that are, in my estimation, looking at it biblically and knowing that we disagree, but we can love God, whether we're a Calvinist or not Calvinist. And, and we have reasons for our beliefs. There, there are reasons for both sides. And based on the text, even though the other side will disagree. Mm -hmm. So we fought together. Well, we're in that situation now. And if we don't stand together, we have no chance of turning the SBC back and stopping the the deterioration and particularly the influx and influence of cultural Marxism through critical race theory and intersectionality. Now, let me make a distinction. Uh, some of the issues we deal with today are topically different than those in the resurgence, Mm -hmm. but they are essentially the same. And this is one of the points I make in my support of him. That means that they undermine the word of God. Okay. So topically we're dealing with CRT. They didn't deal with CRT. We didn't deal with it back then, but what we did deal with and CRT undermines the sufficiency and errancy of the scripture. So they have this essentiality. So we fought together. Uh, The essential issues we're fighting, but the thing that makes this one different in my mind, at least, is that battle we were in, it was uh, very serious. I don't want to minimize that at all, Mm -hmm. but basically it would have destroyed the Southern Baptist Convention. And those of us that were conservative would have left and you would have lost $2 $2 billion worth of property and assets and millions of people who are Southern Baptists who didn't understand the issues would have stayed in and been taken down the road of Methodism, Presbyterianism, and so forth and so on. Mm. This one today, I am convinced that not only will we lose the convention, but we are in the, if the trajectory continues, they are about us losing America country of constitution and laws and you know the 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 amendments to the the bill of rights so in other words we lose everything we lose the forum to have discussions about anything christian and particularly calvinism or 
uh, extensivism. In other words, when we were in it before, we could have still had those discussions. Yeah. But the convention would have been lost. We could have gone somewhere else. If if the Marxian critical race theory and all that is successful, and they are, in my estimation, uh, very widespread, very pervasive, and it's very sophisticated, and it's very detailed. And I've read a lot of the primary documents of the founding CRT people and the uh, Marxists who are driving this thing in education society. If we lose that, we will not be able to discuss it at all. Mm. Wow. Because religious freedom will be taken away. They're very vocal about this, by the way. And Christianity, and they hate the constitutional government, and they hate capitalism. And what I tell people many times about voting and stuff, what we sometimes as Christians, we say, well, I'm just not going to vote and everything. Well, because it, it's not really, you know, it doesn't have religious implications. Well, it does. And, and there are many, but two that are obvious, undeniable to me. Number one is we have the money the discretionary income to support missionaries around the world. Mm, in America. Yeah. Yeah. We have that because we live in a capitalistic country. You do not have that in a socialistic or a Marxist country. The second thing is we have the freedom to do it. Yeah. And we have that because we have a constitutional government, a Republic. And in Marxist countries, you do not have that freedom. So when we vote, we really are voting for missions to be able uh, to do that. And Tom Askell sent me a nice uh, thank you for uh, writing that blog. And, and the basic idea was he, he, he was very gracious. And then he said, and, and if the Lord, you know, grants a victory in this, as we've seen before, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and we'll sit down and talk about our differences. And mm -hmm. that's really profound. We would be able to do that. But the yeah. battle will end will strip us of that freedom to do that. And I do believe it's that serious. Wow. And then the last thing I would say about Tom is in this battle, particularly with CRT, I don't know of an individual that has stood stronger, longer, and paid a greater price than Tom Askell. Mm. What you're going to need, so I, I value that, what you're going to need when somebody gets into the presidency, it is not easy because there won't be very many there that want him there Yeah. on the inside. I'm talking about, and it's going to take a man that has a strong spiritual constitution to withstand the backlash to do what we need to do. Mm. So those are just three of the reasons I think I give seven in the article. Yeah, well, we'll have to, I'll have to link that article uh, in the description as well for this. Of course, I'll give your website, Ronnie W. Rogers, not Ronnie, Ronnie Rogers. <laughs> Ronnie W. Not Rogers. The yeah, no, that's good. That answers my last question, which was just the difference between soteriology and the debate there. Calvinist, not Calvinist, Calvinist, Arminian, Calvinist, extensivist, provisionist, traditionalist, whatever you want to call uh, the, I mean, because even within Calvinism, you, you could put up, pit up, you know, R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur, who differ quite a bit, or, of course, yeah. uh, R.C. Sproul is with the Lord. But um, and, and I think a lot of times people were so, again, to use the common parlance, binary. And this yeah. is it's this or it's this. It's this or it's this. It's like, I mean, yeah, but no. Because <laughs> everybody, yeah. everybody, I, I think if we had a thousand question uh, for theology questionnaire, I doubt any of our closest friends, we would all line up a thousand to a thousand, you know, maybe it'd be 950 or 800 or something, but I would answer questions definitely different than you would. Uh, yeah. And, and MacArthur would, and, and Tom Askell would, and uh, Bodie Bauckham and anybody else late. You mentioned late flowers. I know he yeah. used to be a Calvinist. And so, but are we still Christians? Are we still brothers and sisters in the yeah. Lord? Um, and seeing that battle, I think is exponentially better. Cause again, 40, 50 years ago, you're saying, well, we, we could have left and started uh, the new Southern Baptist Convention yeah. where we all love Jesus and these people are, quote unquote, moderates and they deny the resurrection and penal substitutionary atonement and all. That. But now, if the the critical theory, the intersectional wokeism, uh, social justice really wins, that's all yoked up with communism and, and mar that's cultural true. Marxism. And therefore, that's going to eradicate and sanitize everybody. And that's right not allow any dissent at all. I mean, that's, I say this often, leftism hates dissent and it really does. We see this 
you know, the last two plus years with COVID restrictions and other things. Yeah. There's no dissent. You cannot have a dissenting opinion. And that's how China is. There's no yeah. dissenting opinion. Uh, otherwise, you're going to lose, you know, social credits and, you know, get docked and not have a job and all this other stuff. And you know, that might happen. It might ha not happen. And of course, we have a Lord who reigns supreme and is right. king. And I think we need to we need to remember that, uh, especially the, those who listening uh, for sure. So do you want to add anything else before we before we take off? Well, I, I just, uh, you know, uh, if, if people are Southern Baptists, I pray that they can recognize that the battle we're in convention is greater than the theological battle we're in uh, between Calvinism and, and extensivism, because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. The people yeah. we're warring against, the Marxists, are not that. Yeah. And they are, it's, it's, not, it's not as though I'm guessing at this stuff. It's not that I'm you know, using hyperbole. Uh, I mean, I've read them mm -hmm. and they're very clear about this. And the, I've read the writings that formed the movement of CRT. There's about 27 or 28 of them. Mm. They explicitly wow. refer to Marxists, Marcusa, Gramsci and so forth, and Horkheimer. They uh, use their lines, they use their ideas they, they hate capitalism. This is a common thing. When you read the Marxists, they hate capitalism. And when you read the critical race theorists, they hate capitalism or critical legal theorists. And, and it's already taken over. I think we've transitioned in public education. We were, we were Christian classical, if you will. And then we went to the turn of the 20th century, about 1880 on. We started down the progressive road uh, coming from uh, Rousseau through Henry uh, Herbert Spencer, and then up to men like Thorndike, and then ultimately um, Dewey, who becomes the father. But they took over the teachers' colleges to do that. Mm. And so the CRT people have done that. They've taken over the teachers' colleges. And now I think we have uh, critical theory education is taking the forefront and progressive education it's still there you know when you study the thought throughout history it doesn't just start this and stop this and right it's not so it's overlap academic. yeah yeah it's overlap and blend but but as we moved from christian and classical and it took many years to really uh, almost eradicate it we then went we're in progressive almost totally and now i think we are uh, substantially in critical theory education and progressivism still hanging on but with people like Henry Drew and uh, Paulo Freire and others, they brought it into public education. And that's why you hear the term critical, critical education, critical, right. this, critical science, critical. This. And that all is not meaning think analytically. It's meaning use critical theory from Max Horkheimer. So I, I, I'm just saying it's, it's very serious and much more serious than we think. And I think we can band together just like if we were in, I think Tom Askell and I, if we were younger and we were going to war against a country trying to take over us in the foxhole, we'd both be shooting at the enemy, not at each other. Right. And that's, that's what we're in. It's just ideological and theological uh, for God's honor. And, and on Easter, you know, we all just had this one of the points I made, and I, I hope we don't have to, people don't have to debate this, but Christ as a human, when he was alive, he did everything according to the will of the Father. Mm -hmm. Everything was happening. When he died, the time he was dead, and I know he was spiritually alive and all of that, but I'm just talking about when he was dead, he couldn't get himself to the tomb. He couldn't pick the rich man's tomb. He couldn't uh, get the stone moved. He's dead. Mm -hmm. Humanly, he's dead. So, and, and before that, he did everything the father wanted him to do. And now when he's in a situation, he can do nothing. The father would do everything. Mm -hmm. And everything was still fulfilling scripture to the nth degree. Well, I think that's where we are. We can do something. And God uses his people and we should follow him in fighting these ungodly battles like using these things as analytical tools mm -hmm. no, that's good well wise words thank you so much again ronnie i appreciate thank the you. time um go ahead and 
yeah, check out uh, Ronnie's website, uh, RonnieWRogers.com, and also uh, TrinityNorman.org is the church's website as well. They're in Oklahoma, been there a pastor a long time, and um, you write a lot. You've written books. Uh, I'll put those descriptions in the, or those links in the description. Okay. And uh, yeah, it'd be great. I appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Thank and, you, uh, Richard. Yeah, we'll have a good have rest a good of the day. Evening. Thanks. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.